Hello, listeners. Welcome to Media Coffee, a podcast series hosted by Cision, where we delve into the world of media and communications. I am your host, Nathan, and in this episode, we are excited to have a very special guest, Andrea Hubbard, a copywriter who helps clients connect with their audiences in meaningful ways and founder of Hub & Company here in the United States. Andrea brings a wealth of experience and expertise as a copywriter, helping clients navigate the ever-evolving media landscape. Throughout the episode, we will explore some of the most pressing questions our clients have about effectively communicating with the media, and Andrea will provide valuable insights and practical advice. As a global provider of earned media software and services, Cision aims to equip PR agencies and communications professionals with the tools and knowledge they need to succeed. We believe that understanding the media industry and building strong relationships with journalists is crucial for effective communication strategies. If you're curious to learn more about Cision and how we can ha- assist you in enhancing your PR efforts, please visit our website, reach out via email, or follow us on our social media accounts for the latest news and updates. Well, to get started, Andrea, I want to thank you for being a guest on today's episode. And I would like for us to start out by uh, telling the listeners a little bit more about yourself, Hub & Company, and what inspired you to get into copywriting and PR strategy. Sure. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So I have been doing copywriting NPR um, strategy and implementation for more years than I care to admit. Um, But I will say that I think I got the bug, even though I probably couldn't identify it when I was very young, as in middle school age, because I was always talking in class and telling the story of the day, so much so that I got sent home every single day with a report card that said how disruptive I was or wasn't in class. Yeah. <laughs> so I got the bug early mm-hmm. and um, I decided when I was in high school, I thought I was going to go into advertising. Mm-hmm. But then in college, I had a PR internship and my semester long internship turned into three and a half semester or mm-hmm. three and a half years. So I was there almost my whole time. And I got to do so many things in PR that I just fell in love with it. I really did. Mm-hmm. I did my first high profile legit PR campaign uh, when I was 19 and I never looked back. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what about uh, Hub & Company? Could you, yeah. Yeah. So Hub & Company uh, is going to be celebrating 10 years at the end of the, at the end of July. Awesome. Congrats. Yeah. So I I kind of fell into it, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I've had one corporate job my whole career Mm -hmm. and it was, um, you know, long story short, it was ending and I um, didn't know what I was going to do. And someone called and asked me to help with services. And I sort of just started the business because it felt like the Mm -hmm. right thing to do because of what I was doing at the time. Mm -hmm. So I fell into it 10 years ago and have loved it ever since. What I really love about it is the relationship building with my clients and with the media and telling stories i just yes. love being able to tell stories all right thank you for sharing that with us see, see nathan uh, do you see why i got in trouble in school i yeah. barely <laughs> and a word in <laughs> oh no no it's fine it's fine you know uh the more you talk the better is that's good <laughs> Um, All right. Thank you for sharing uh, that intro with us. And we'll get right into the questions. So a common question that we start out with um, on the podcast is asking our guests how PR and comms professionals can make their pitches stand out to journalists and media outlets. A common struggle for most of our clients and listeners is pitching uh, to journalists. So in your opinion, what are some of the best practices for pitching? I think the the very first thing to remember is that the media doesn't care about us. (laughs) They really don't. They care about what our products and our services can do for their audiences. Mm -hmm. So as long as we remember that whatever it is that we're pitching has been um, well-defined, the audience is in alignment, then we shouldn't have any fear about sharing that information because all we're doing is exposing them to a new product or service that will be of value to our to their audience. Mm-hmm. 
Yes. So I think that's the first thing to remember. Then it's about, okay, making sure that we are doing the research to understand. And I, I'm just going to say media in, in general, but mm-hmm. it could be radio, TV, print, whatever. Yes. That the media that we're pitching has an interest in mm-hmm. what we're pitching, right? So have they mm-hmm. written about it before? If not, is it something that it looks like they might write about based on yes. what they have? covered and based on the audience that they have and based on you know the season that it is whatever the right criteria is at the time making sure that we've done that research of the publication itself and of the person we're pitching yes i think that sometimes that gets overlooked you know Mm -hmm. media professionals are people they're not order takers right so it's important for us to understand what is going to light them up what is going to make them take notice and pitch in in that manner right Mm -hmm. so we have to tailor our pitches depending on who we're pitching to of course but then it comes down to really having that compelling subject line because they're never going to get to the pitch if they don't open the email and what i've heard many times is that the, the, the simpler and more straightforward the subject line, the more likely it is to be open. Yes. Because if they have to try and interpret what you're mm-hmm. saying, it's a pass, right? They're busy. Yeah. So I think that as well as being, once they do open it and read it, being clear and concise. Sometimes we like to tell our whole story in the email and that's not helpful. Mm-hmm. What's helpful is what are the highlights, right? Yeah. What's Fizzle real. And if I'm interested, then I will ask you for the details. Yes. Yes. Uh, and to follow up with that question, uh, how soon uh, do you think a professional should follow up with journalists on their pitches? And how many times uh, should they uh, follow up? Should they follow up once after not receiving a response or should they follow up multiple times? Uh, I think the follow up is just as important as the pitch. I'm really glad that you asked that because I cannot tell you how many times I've gotten coverage because of the Mm follow-up. So I think follow-up three to seven, depending on the timeliness of the pitch, right? If if your pitch is something related to what's happening in the media right now, like if it was related to, um, you know, um, the affirmative action reversal by the Supreme Court, well, you're going to want to pitch probably sooner, three days or so later. If it's a little bit less timely, more evergreen, then I would say wait a week, right? I don't, and of course it depends on where you're pitching. If you're pitching Mm -hmm. a long lead publication, then a week is is going to feel like three days to them, right? (laughs) Whereas a morning show, three days is going to feel like three days. So it depends on where you're pitching. Um, And I would say do it a few times and do it in a a few different ways. Mm -hmm. I have found that people are afraid these days to pick up the phone and call, and Mm -hmm. you shouldn't be, because sometimes they don't even know that you sent them an email. If you send another email, (laughs) they're going to miss that too. Pick up the phone and call and say, hey, I'm Called, I'm following up on this email that I sent to you about X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Um, I think always pitch three to seven days for your first follow up, depending on how timely the story is, mm-hmm. um, and do a couple different ones in a couple different ways. Yes, I, I do like that. That's great advice. Um, the last question for this topic I want to ask is What are some of the way, best ways to build and maintain relationships with journalists and media outlets? And if you like as well, uh, you could share some examples of some ses- successful connections you facilitated um, as well, if you'd like. Sure. So, um, again, I think it goes back to understanding who they are as a person. Mm-hmm. So, I always look for, I look on social media, I look at their bios, I look at what they've written about, you know, all of those things. And what I'm looking for is a common point of interest because, again, they're humans, right? And if we can break the ice and start a meaningful conversation based on something that we have in common, that's going to be a lot better than just sending a cold pitch, right? Um, even if they don't accept the story at that time, they're they're going to have a more favorable response to you and your next pitch and your next pitch because you've got that common thing that you can always go back to. So I would say that first. The, the next thing then is really being respectful of the timelines, right? The, the conditions that they're working under, especially since there's less people in newsrooms now, there's less coverage on the weekend. So it used to be that you could you know, call and 
take them out to lunch or uh, for coffee or whatever. And that that's not usually the case these days. So be respectful of that. Get to the point right away um, and understand the, uh, the ebbs and flows of a newsroom, right? So what, when is the right time to call? If you're calling, you know, the TV um, news, uh, news for a news broadcast, you know, you're not going to want to call when they're in their afternoon meeting. You're not going to want to call when they're in their morning meeting. You're not going to want to call 30 minutes. Before, you know what I mean? Like understand how the, the, the environment that they work in works. Um, I think it's also good when you attend industry events or networking opportunities, especially if you're trying to build relationships with local media, which I think everybody should do, um, because especially if you're a small business and especially if you're starting out, building those relationships with local media, it's going to help you with your placements for sure. Um, but also it, it's going to help you to get larger placements down the road whether it be through the clips that you get or through the relationships that you build. Because, you know, if someone is in, I'm in Milwaukee, if someone's in the local ABC affiliate at Mo, in Milwaukee, they're always looking to figure out how can their story be national, ABC News nationally. So I think building relationships with local media by attending networking opportunities or, um, or nationally with industry events is always helpful. And then become that reliable source, become somebody that the media outlet can rely on for credible information. Because once you build the relationship, they will come to you and ask you either for source um, uh, addition to their, their piece or for new stories, if if you have a new story that they can cover. So be respectful, be um, uh, personable, uh, be reliable, and then maintain that regular contact, right? Once you get a story placed, it's not the time to kind of end it. It's time to start building towards the next story and then the yes. next story. Yes, that was very insightful. Thank you for um, sharing that. Um, to move along, I want to uh, move on to our next topic, which is the importance of press releases in PR strategy. Um, in your opinion, how important is the use of press releases in this day and age? Well, I think that press releases, our poor little friends get a bad rap sometimes. People are like, press yes. releases are dead. <laughs> and <you shouldn't>, and <laughs> I don't agree with that at mm -hmm. all. I think the way we use a press release has changed. Absolutely. So how I do it is I use press releases in a couple of different ways. I use it if it's evergreen information. I use it um, if it's in a crisis situation and we want to make sure that the information is shared, that shared is consistent across the board. Um, for SEO benefits. So sometimes you might write the press release and put it on your website and you may or may not distribute it actively to media, but you get the SEO benefits of it. Um, if you have investor relations, if you're a larger organization and you have investor relations, it's a great way to communicate all of the financial information without somebody getting confused um, or it, them hearing it in five different ways, right? So I think that the benefits of press releases are huge. The way we distribute them, if we're not distributing them through a service like yours, is um, when we, if we're just, you know, if we're, we're we're working our local contacts, right? Those people that we've build, been building relationships with. I don't know why I'm stumbling over my words, but um, it's important then, and I always do this to put some sort of introduction to the press release, right? To to share the information. Why am I sharing this with you? What are the highlights of the story or the angle? And then let them know that all the details are in the press release. And that I have found has been really, really helpful because if they're not even interested in the highlights or why you're sharing it with them, they're never going to read the press release and vice versa. If they are, they're going to want to get more information, which then turns your press release into a conversation starter. All right. That was very insightful. Thank you for sharing that. You actually answered the next two questions I was going to ask, <laughs> follow up with that. So we'll go ahead and move on to the next topic, which is uh, building a personal brand. Uh, how do you establish and maintain your brand within the industry and how has it helped with your career? Yeah, there's so many benefits of it, right? It's increased visibility, it's authority and credibility, client attraction, more opportunities from media, uh, higher fees, it goes on and on and on. And so I, I do it in a few different ways. Um, podcasts like this one, I love being on podcasts and talking 
you know, again, I'm a talker sharing stories, <laughs> but I also enjoy uh, being on a stage and doing speaking engagements to build my, my visibility and my brand. Um, guest blogging, I've done some of that. And I enjoy that because of the copywriting side, the writing side of what I do. Mentorship and coaching. I think that this is a great way to build brand that may be overlooked a lot is when you take the time to mentor and coach somebody. And I don't even mean that in a formal engagement standpoint. I just mean, you know, if you meet somebody and they ask you a couple of questions, you know, share that expertise and wisdom with them. Um, I'm not saying give away the sink, you know, but it, it doesn't hurt to pass on our wisdom to other people. Um, and that's helpful to them because then they're going to tell other people about you as well, right? Continuous learning and professional development. I know that that's not often looked at as a way to build your brand, but it certainly is because once you start learning new things, at least for me, I start thinking differently, like critical thinking shifts when I start actively learning. And then you you have the ability to deepen your learning or anchor whatever it is that you're learning by sharing it with other people, which helps you to build your brand because you're constantly staying in line with what's happening within your own industry. Um, and one of my favorite, favorite ways is being involved in the community, whether it be through volunteer, whether it be through pro bono work, or whether it just be attending events that are happening. I do agree that it's very important. Uh, thank you for sharing. Sure. Um, well, I guess we can move on to the last topic of uh, our podcast for today, which is advice to um, PR pr professionals or just as aspiring PR professionals. Um, the first question I'll ask is, how do you manage competing priorities and ensure that each client receives the necessary attention and support from you? Mm, such a good, <laughs> such a good question, because it can be a struggle, especially when you um, have more clients than you maybe should have, which I may or may not be speaking from personal experience on that one. <laughs> you can have too many clients at one time. Um, but I, in general, it comes down to really setting those clear expectations you know, of what the relationship's going to entail. What are the expectations like around communicating um, or around milestones, response times, deliverables, things like that. Um, and being really open um, and making sure those lines of communication are open because we don't want to be secretive and withhold information because then it seems like we're either not doing the things that we said we were going to do or we are uh, making it up as we go, or, you know, all of these things that we, are impressions that we don't want to leave because we are experts. Even if we're just starting, the, the making the decision to be a PR professional automatically gives you a level of expertise, right? Because you wouldn't do it if you didn't think you had the ability to do it. Now, of course, you can always grow and develop and learn as you do it, but you're at, by making that, that, start by starting you've got some level of expertise right so um being efficient with our time management uh i know i've talked about research a lot and, and you can go down so many rabbit holes researching so really making sure that you set the boundaries of how you manage your time across all of the activities that you need to do in order to be a good pr counselor um, but then also being flexible and adaptable because things will come up. This just happened to me earlier this month. I was doing PR for a festival and uh, it sort of took off. Like there was a lot of interest from media, which meant that I had to readjust the things that I was going to do for other clients, right? So you've got to make sure that you build in flexibility and ad adapt. And ad why am I stumbling on my words? And adaptability, because you never know when something's going to take off and you're going to have to be responsible to people who are from the media who are actively looking for information because you don't want to lose those opportunities. You don't want to lose that coverage. Right. Yes. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, well, I guess that will lead into our to my final question. Uh, you kind of uh, dropped some gems in there. Uh, the the last part of your answer, but uh, are there any other uh, valuable lessons or advice that you would like to share with our listeners uh, looking to succeed in uh, this industry? Yeah, I think the number one thing is 
that when somebody hires you, um, they're looking to you as the expert. They're looking for you to guide and coach. And I wouldn't be afraid to do that. And I wouldn't be afraid to push back on things because sometimes clients think that they know what's best for them when it really isn't. And if it's not, we need to figure out tactical ways to let them know that it's not. Um, I also think embedding yourself in your client's business as a partner to them is really helpful to both of you because if you can start seeing yourself as you know taking some ownership in the business i'm not talking about the the financial revenue relation uh related parts of their business but the strategy right if you can help embed yourself from a strategic standpoint that's gonna wholly help you as you start to implement because you have a much better understanding of what the what's being what's trying to be achieved what their business is doing where they're trying to go all of the things that you need in order to put together a great PR strategy for them so I I think it's you know being the counselor leader speaking up when things are when they're asking you to do things that you know are not right, embedding yourself in as a real partner to your client, um, and then keeping those lines of communication open. Those are really things that I found have been helpful to me. And then, of course, delivering great work, right? Doing what you said you were going to do, because that's how that's going to keep them coming to you, and it's going to invite them to bring more people your way. <laughs> Yes, I agree with that. Uh, well, Andrea, thank you again for being a guest on our podcast. I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your insights and expertise. And to all of our listeners, if you enjoyed the episode, please feel free to share it with your friends and colleagues. Uh, take care and have a great day.